right. Welcome, everyone. I appreciate your interest in uh, the Interdisciplinary Research Leaders Program uh, and welcome you to our informational webinar. Um, we're having uh, uh, folks come in uh, as we go, but we're a few minutes past uh, the top of the hour and we'll get started. Um, thanks very much for your interest in the program and in our uh, call for applications for uh, our seventh cohort of the Interdisciplinary Research Leaders Program. Uh, I'm Tobin Nelson, uh, along with Vanya Jones, I co-direct the IRL program. And we'll be joined today by other members of the IRL leadership team, uh, program participants and alumni to share with you key features of the IRL program and provide suggestions on how to prepare an application. This webinar provides an opportunity to learn about the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's culture of health uh, vision and leadership development programs. Uh, provides an opportunity to understand uh, more about the Interdisciplinary Research Leaders Program and the current funding opportunity. Uh, provides an opportunity to understand the application process for obtaining funding and uh, gives you an opportunity to ask questions. Also, I just want to uh, highlight a few housekeeping notes about uh, sharing uh, for this webinar. Please submit any questions through the Q&A feature of Zoom. Uh, this webinar will be recorded and uh, will be available on the IRL program recruitment website within the next week. If you uh, need to go back and reference it or have others who are interested in the program, you can certainly share that information with them. Uh, if your question doesn't get answered during this webinar, please email your question to researchleaders at umn.edu, and we will be certain to respond uh, via that email. Um, and next slide. Um, so today our, our presenters are uh, Sheldon Oliver Watts, who's a senior program officer with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Uh, myself and Vanya Jones are co-directors for the IRL program. And Zinzi Bailey, who serves as an associate director for the IRL program. My next slide. We're also delighted to have with us today Marcus Bernard, uh, who's an alumni community partner uh, and fellow from cohort two of the IRL program and Team Black Belt Alabama. And Marcus also serves as a member of the IRL Community Action Advisory Board. Uh, Marcus is going to speak about his experience as a community partner within the IRL program. Uh, Marcus is on the line and we'll, we'll uh, get to him uh, a little bit later in this presentation. Next slide. Uh, in addition, we have one of our current IRL teams with us to speak about their experience in the IRL program. Two members from Team Mississippi, Carlton and Mina, uh, are on the line and will share their experience uh, again a little bit later in this presentation. Uh, I'm now going to turn it over to Sheldon Oliver Watts from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, who will provide an overview of the driving vision for this work, creating a culture of health in our country. Go ahead, Sheldon. Great. Thank you. Thank you and good afternoon. I'm delighted to have this opportunity to share information about the change leadership programs from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. The program we'll be discussing today and all the work at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation focuses on a national movement that we call a culture of health. This vision creates a society where every person has an equal opportunity to live the healthiest life they can, no matter their ethnic, geographic, racial, socioeconomic, or physical circumstance. It embraces a more integrated, comprehensive approach to health, encompasses both health, health care, and many of the other critical factors that impact people's health, such as early childhood development, education, housing, jobs, the built environment. And finally, requires unprecedented collaboration across racial, class, geographic, sector, and issue lines. A culture of health looks very different in every community. We recognize that it is an audacious vision. It requires us to tackle the root causes of health inequities, such as racism and poverty. It requires unprecedented collaboration with everyone playing a role, parents, coworkers, neighbors, civic leaders, policymakers, business and industry. Next slide, please. In the fall of 2016, 
the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation launched four leadership development programs as part of its culture of health commitment. They are listed here. Clinical Scholars prepares doctors, nurses, and other healthcare providers to transcend their traditional healthcare roles, work together across disciplines, and help address complex local health challenges. Health Policy Research Scholars supports efforts of doctoral students in any academic discipline who want to apply their research to help build healthier and more equitable communities. Culture of Health Leaders enables leaders in all fields such as transportation, urban planning, business, arts, and economic development to challenge systems, tackle the root causes of health disparities, and build healthier communities. And finally, the Interdisciplinary Research Leaders supports academic and community research partnerships to co-develop meaningful research questions that address community-driven concerns and spark immediate community actions and solutions. Through these programs, the foundation funds visionary leaders who are committed to bringing about important change. These programs help build the integrative skills and relationships necessary to extend the influence and impact of leaders working to build a culture of health. I won't go into greater detail about these programs, but I invite you to visit the website shown here and learn more about the change leadership programs. Next slide, please. So who are we looking for in this program? Well, it may be you. If you embrace the vision of a culture of health and are willing to put advancing health equity at the center of your work, have proven experience working and thinking collaboratively across sectors and across disciplines, embody insight, courage, and a commitment to lifelong growth and development, including learning and collaboration with program participants and alumni, exhibit leadership skills or leadership potential and have or want to develop strong critical and system thinking skills. Understand the importance of cultural humility and recognize the value of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And finally, are comfortable with complexity, ambiguity, and risk-taking. This program may be a good fit. And now let's turn it over to Vanya Jones, one of our esteemed interdisciplinary research leaders program co-directors to discuss the program more explicitly. Thank you. Thank you, Sheldon, and thank you for that great introduction to the program. I'm so pleased to share information about our national leadership program called the Interdisciplinary Research Leaders Program. We bring together researchers and community partners to co-develop meaningful research questions that address community identified concerns. We're looking for groups that collaborate to conduct research that can create community change with a clear focus on health, uh, health and equity. Next slide, please. So for the cohort seven call for applications, we are focusing on the theme of structural racism. Structural racism refers to the totality of ways in which societies foster racial discrimination through mutually reinforced systems of housing, education, employment, earnings, benefits, credit, media, healthcare, and criminal justice, and, and a lot of other entities. I'd like to point out that this is uh, work that was done by our own um, Dr. Bailey on this call, who will present some more work about IRL. Uh, structural racism is manifested in policies, practices, and programs in ways that segregate and prioritize populations based on race and ethnicity. We're looking for proposals based, in, in, based to change institutional systems, including those that are beyond healthcare. So think about those earnings, benefits, credit, media, all of those things that we listed above. Proposals that build on evidence for solutions to eliminate the structures that perpetuate racial inequities in health rather than proposals that seek to further document the existence or impact of structural racism are what we're looking for. Here at IRL, we believe structural racism exists. We don't look for people to document it. We're looking for how we can make change. Next slide, please. How we're gonna do that is through the, our program and IRL is a three-year three program designed to engage teams of researchers and community leaders to conduct health research that addresses pressing needs of specific communities. Our goal is to advance a culture of health through research that leads action and community impact. IRL is committed to interdisciplinary teams within cohorts with consideration given to diversity across disciplines, backgrounds, and perspectives. Participants will have the opportunity to learn from through advanced curriculum in health policy, health equity, population health, and from experts of other fellows within their own cohort and across the cohorts in the program. Since this program is a departure from typical research grants, I wanna illustrate some of the distinct components of the IRL experience. So we do have community action research 
And we'll talk a little bit about the developments of methods, but we'll also talk about policy and the relationship between policy and your work. That's both laws and legislation as well as operations and procedures. We'll talk about dissemination and networking opportunities. And for the interdisciplinary collaborations, you've already met part of our team at IRL, but we also have a cohort system where there are up to seven cohorts that are gonna be in this program when this cohort enters. That includes alumni and current fellows. We also have a large program that we're gonna work with other experts in the field around the country to talk about changing structural racism. Next slide, please. So how do we do that? We have some program activities that we're gonna do, that we do within our cohorts and our fellows. We co-develop, um, we have you co-develop a community engaged, community impactful research project. This is the foundation for the experiential learning. So while the, this is a fellowship program, we are gonna ask you to engage in some research two to three in-person meetings per year. Right now, those meetings are hybrid. And so we are offering the opportunity to experience those um, in, a, in a virtual setting, but we are offering in-person opportunities. These include cross cohort engagement and networking opportunities. There are ongoing cohort activities that includes team and program collaboration to support team research projects. So we have some additional opportunities. Team project specific mentorship. We provide you with mentors that you may identify or ones that we might suggest. We have a weekly webinar. So we ask you to join us to have community dialogue every week. And then we have many courses that you'll have access to. Next slide, please. So for the program support, every fellow in IRL receives $25,000 annually to support their time to participate in these activities. There's a one-time research project grant of up to $125,000 per team. We do have some indirect cost rates. We get asked this often. So you'll see here that 12% for colleges and universities up to 20% for nonprofit organizations. And we don't provide uh, indirect costs for for-profit organizations or government entities. We provide your travel expenses. Those are external to your research project and your fellowship support. So for those hybrid meetings, if you choose to join us in person, we'll pay your expenses. We also provide the expenses for mentorship and professional development opportunities when it comes to participating in IRL programs. Again, those are in addition to the work that you would be doing with your fellowship support and your research project. Next slide, please. So who can be in this program? The teams must be comprised of three mid-career individuals. The, these three, these three mid-career individuals, one will be a community partner and two will be research partners. The team must be fully collaborative, so co-led. There is no principal investigator in any IRL program that's funded as a fellowship team. I wanna repeat that. No one serves as principal investigator. We live the, the philosophy that this is shared leadership and we want you to, to share that leadership with all aspects. Each team member must be a US citizen, permanent resident, or individual granted DACA status at the time of application. Please see our full criteria listing in our call for applications. Next slide, please. We get asked this question probably more than most when it comes to applying for IRL. What does it mean to be mid-career? We want someone with experience who's not about to retire. That's the essential answer. But as the slide says, someone with experience in the work that you're proposing to do. Our community partner, we're asking to have at least five years of experience and not retiring within 10 years and an established relationship in the community. And we asked you that in the application. How is your relationship established with the community you're working with? We're looking for a research partner that's uh, five years post PhD and not retiring within 10 years. You see the parallel there. We also are not accepting graduate or postdoctoral students or trainees as IRL fellows. What we want are people who are working with experience who are gonna be able to continue leading in this work for some time. Next slide, please. The selection criteria. The proposed research project must be developed with an engaged community perspective. We wanna make sure this project addresses problems for our community. The project is responsive to the theme highlighted in the call for applications. This is structural racism. The community partner can facilitate engagement with the community. We wanna know that there's a relationship. The team of fellows has demonstrated commitment to interdisciplinary and community engaged work. Research has a strong potential to inform policy or action that makes change. The ability to execute the research project within the time frame and the budget. Please see the call for applications for complete selection criteria information. Next slide, please. What's our process? How do we get the 15 up to 15 teams that will make up cohort seven? The selection committee of the IRL program leadership, external consultants, 
IRL National Advisory Committee, which is otherwise known as our NAC, and the RWJF staff comprise that committee. Semifinalists will be invited for online team interviews. IRL staff, IRL NAC will make funding recommendations to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. The Robert Wood Johnson Foundation makes the final team selection and we will end up with up to 15 teams for cohort seven. Next slide, please. It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce Marcus Bernard, one of our community partners and our NAC members for the IRL program. Thank you, Vanya. And today, my job is to talk about the IRL opportunity for community leaders. So I believe there is both a high desire on the part of our community partners and a strong need for growing research partnerships and skills in our field to be able to understand and convey impact about this work. Far too often in our partner organizations, research and evaluation is funded as a special initiative or with soft philanthropic resources, making it more episodic. So relationships with researchers may be strong and consistent in some cases or communities, but for others out of reach or driven by those outside of the community. So the social determinants of health framework, it has strengthened or created new partnerships with healthcare and public health for community development but understanding what that means, what works, and how to advance this shared work is emerging. Because the IRL is also a leadership development program, and I just want to say that again, because the IRL is also a leadership development program, we believe this is a great opportunity to further develop those relationships and skills and community-based partners can bring a lot as equal partners to the team. Next slide. Community partners for the IRL program have a variety of roles and positions in a wide array of organizations and agencies. Here are just a few examples of community partners currently in cohort four of the IRL program. Now we included cohort four because we didn't have the photos for cohort five. So um, don't think we like, you know, skip cohorts here. <laughs> so the first one is uh, Valika Barisha, who's a senior epidemiologist at Maricopa County Department of Public Health. Adrian Ricker, adjunct faculty at Fort Peck Community College. Kia Baker, who is executive director at Southeast Raleigh Promise. Isaiah Hernandez, executive director of the East Mott Community Center. Evelyn Coker, licensed clinical social worker. And Madia Tariq, deputy director of the Arab Community Center for Economic and Social Services Access. Next slide, please. So there were two themes in cohort four, uh, community development and health, the first, and clinical practice, social services and health, the second. So I just wanna give you some examples of these team makeups. So, the first in uh, under community development and health, we have a landscape architect teaming up with an environmental psychologist and a general pediatrician and public health researcher to work on leveraging greener schoolyards for better health. Second, we have a social sciences researcher and a manager of a 501c3 in seven Southern US states collaborating with an economist focused on health, housing, and economic oppression to invest in water and wastewater systems to reduce health and economic inequalities in the rural South. 
Under the second thing, we have a mental health professional and a trauma prevention and intervention researcher collaborating with a researcher focused on intersections of public health and poverty in enacting policy change to strengthen communities with trauma-informed care. Then we have a health services administrator teaming up with a general practitioner and a vulnerable populations researcher to reduce disparities by identifying and overcoming barriers to reporting elder abuse to adult protective services. Next slide, please. So to ground this program in an example that you can hear from, we want to introduce one of our current IRL teams in Mississippi. We have with us Mina Malton. Um, we have Carlton Turner. Uh, and we have, uh, excuse me, uh, the third partner, Erica, unfortunately was not able to be here today, but they're gonna take a few minutes and talk to you. Uh, Mina and Carlton? Yes, we're here. Uh, awesome, yeah. can, you can you share with us what drew you to apply for this program? Yes, this is Mina. I can I can start us off. And Marcus and to the other members of the IRL team, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, so I am one of the research partners on our team. Um, and I will say up until very recently, I served as the managing director at Imagine America, uh, which is a national consortium of colleges and universities based out of UC Davis. And so um, for a number of years, I had been providing research support in a national community university partnership called Performing Our Future. Uh, and, and then around 2018, we were developing the next stage of this work of our creative community development work. Um, and at the same time, our long-term friend and colleague Carlton Turner was establishing the Mississippi Center for Cultural Production. Um, so we really saw an opportunity here to work with uh, uh, SIP culture uh, on, in its foundational stage. Um, and I'll also say, you know, on a more personal level, I was at a stage in my career where I recognized a need for more structured leadership development support in a manner that felt holistic. Um, so, you know, we found out about IRL Serendipish, uh, Dipish, ah, blah, blah. <laughs> early in the morning over here in California. Um, uh, we found out through a colleague from a National uh, Research and Action Institute who forwarded IRL's call for fellows, um, which as you just mentioned, was uh, had a community development track. And it appeared to be really an excellent fit with supporting the next stage of our work together. Carlton, do you have anything to add? Yeah, um, no, not to that question. I'll answer the next question. Okay, sure. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Mina. Uh, Carlton, can you tell us what has been your experience in the program? So, you know, I have to color any any answer I give with, uh, we were we are the COVID cohort. So we had our meeting, uh, first gathering uh, happened in November of 2019. Uh, and we didn't meet again until uh, last month in, uh, in San Diego. This was in person. So um, our a lot of disruption came through COVID and, and that was when our cohort was really um, supposed to be hitting its stride. Um, I would say that uh, despite that, be, and because of our relationship, uh, the relationship that we had as an organization, um, together, SIP Culture and, and Imagining America, the relationship we had as individuals um, between the three of us having worked together for a long time, uh, we were able to persevere through uh, this tumultuous moment of COVID and actually uh, do some really, we think, effective work. The work was based in Utica. Uh, the, the, the researchers were based in California. So most of our time was spent virtually. Uh, we were able to uh, get together uh, in some of the low points of COVID uh, physically in uh, Mississippi and do some work on the ground, which was really helpful to our work. Uh, but the experience is, uh, that I, I would be most that I'm most impressed with is just the the flexibility that 
um, the, the program show throughout the, the process of, of COVID and how everything was shifting. Um, you know, IRL was really uh, intuitive in, in the way that they approach making adjustments uh, to make sure that our projects and our relationships um, were supported as much as possible. Thank you. So last question, how did your team come together? Well, we've been knowing each other for a good long time. Um, um, I have been part of the National Advisory Board for Imagining America for more than years than I can remember, um, and um, have been working with uh, Imagining America even prior to uh, Mina or Erica coming on staff. Uh, but uh, when this opportunity came about, uh, we saw it as a real chance to, to deepen our work together uh, and, and really focus on a um, looking at some baseline evaluation metrics for um, a new type of programming. I, I, I'll be remiss to say uh, we were probably one of the first, if not, uh, I don't know, I'm not going to say we're the only, but there's not many arts and culture organizations that have received this type of research support, specifically through this program. Uh, so we took that as a sign that, that the work that we were doing was really uh, important and validated by this program. Mina? I, I think that about covers it. You know, um, as I had mentioned, Carlton was establishing SIP culture. And I think um, we, we just saw this opportunity to really further that partnership. Eric and I worked together at Imagine in America. And so we'd all in different capacities been working together, I think for upwards over 10 years on the different types of research activities. So it just felt a natural next step. Awesome to hear, and I'm glad you're together. Uh, can you please advance to the next slide? Now I would like to turn to the training aspects of the IRL program, and we'll turn it over uh, to the great uh, Dr. Zinzi. Thank you so much. Um, so. Um, I guess this is in the, the time to get a sense of what the IRL program is. Um, and we use this kind of graphic just to give you a snapshot of what it could be, right? So this figure illustrates the distinct components of the program experience. Uh, the program is a blend of research. If you look in the kind of red burgundy maroon, maroon color, color, primarily on the top, um, and uh, leadership development and a focused curriculum in teal um, on the bottom, right? On the research side, um, as you'll hear later, uh, teams will plan um, and implement a specific, uh, you know, action-oriented project, right? Um, and the research is really the centerpiece of the program experience. Um, but it's also kind of like a capstone to, um, you know, an opportunity to apply what you will uh, gain or, or glean from the exper experiential learning opportunities through the program. Um, on the leadership development side, you will participate in uh, the curriculum and the learning community throughout, uh, through various different mechanisms, and you'll plan uh, for dissemination and translation from the very beginning of the program. Um, and then um, as you move forward, the last six months will be dedicated to communicating research results to relevant stakeholders, um, but planning for that translation will begin from the very start of the program. So, um, you know, after that, uh, if we go all the way to the right, when fellows become alumni, we expect that they will be leaders um, uh, conducting action-oriented uh, research, um, uh, community-driven research, and will continue to cultivate and expand the networks that they build during this program. Uh, next slide, please. Our curriculum is designed around our key goal, uh, which is to produce leaders um, that conduct innovative, rigorous, team-based research that can be used to, simultaneous, uh, to stimulate action and policy settings to build a culture of health, health in the United States. As such, there are four main interconnected domains of the IRL curriculum that flow directly from that goal. Uh, first, we have collaboration and community engagement. Um, and this goal is to facilitate effective, ethical uh, research community partnerships across diverse disciplines and sectors. Um, the second, um, community change leadership, um, which is a goal 
focused on understanding issues facing the community, communities, um, and how to build and lead movements to create change that will promote health equity, including deep knowledge and application of equity, diversity, and inclusion. Third, we have policy and communication. Um, in this goal, we, uh, you know, we think, uh, you know, we're hoping for, um, you know, being able to communicate uh, research outcomes to achieve policy objectives through a solid understanding of the policymaking process and relevant stakeholders. And fourth, um, the credible and transparent research. So um, we are hoping that all of the projects are applying uh, scientifically sound methodologies to uh, uh, answer relevant community-oriented research questions driving towards actionable change. Next slide, please. And so our curriculum will be delivered through a combination of virtual and in-person formats. Um, and we are flexible, especially um, uh, considering, uh, you know, our responsiveness to the COVID-19 pandemic, right? Um, we will have up to uh, eight in-person sessions or hybrid sessions over the three years of the program, um, an annual uh, IRL specific uh, meetings every fall in Minnesota. Um, um, and uh, we may have a kind of a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation um, annual meeting where the location may vary. Um, and then uh, a meeting in DC for the cohorts uh, first and third years of the program. Um, and that is focused on that policy and communication. There will also be several short online courses through the uh, three years that program fellows will take. Um, some are, uh, you know, uh, you know, part of the main curriculum, but some are, you know, available uh, to whoever might identify that as something that they might need. Um, we will also create and maintain a learning community through weekly uh, research and progress uh, webinars, which will uh, allow for uh, cross cohort learning and professional development um, and within cohort learning um, uh, and advancing um, some of this work, right? And then finally, mentoring will enhance the learning objectives through hands-on coaching, advice, and assistance, right? Um, and the goal of the curriculum is not uh, learning for knowledge's sake, but to apply skills uh, to key research projects um, in, through the planning, implementation, team coordination, communication within the team, and translating evidence to stakeholders and decision makers. And um, uh, another key part of this um, being to uh, community members for mobilization. Next slide, please. And now I will uh, turn to uh, some of the research aspects of IRL. Next slide. Um, so the IRL uh, program has several components, but it's ultimately a research program. Um, and uh, the research project will be the centerpiece of the IRL experience. Things are wrapped around that uh, research uh, experience. Um, and so um, a key uh, feature of the IRL program that we are looking to support uh, that we're trying to do is we're trying to we're looking to support research that has a high likelihood of driving action and change in communities and policies right so we're looking to support uh, rigorous high quality research um, and uh, and really not just saying it's going to look in one particular way we're interested in different kinds of research right we want diversity amongst the irl teams in terms of study populations scientific disciplines and methodologies uh, and this means uh, both qualitative and quantitative research um, but also thinking about different kinds of research designs including case studies um, evaluations of interventions experiments financial, economic, and cost-effectiveness studies, uh, health impact assessments, legal analyses, natural experiments, policy analyses, uh, existing um, you know, secondary data analyses, uh, qualitative uh, ethnographic investigations, or other action-oriented designs. Next slide. And so um, when prospective IRL teams apply to the program, they will apply with a proposed research project. For the accepted teams, the first six months of the program will be dedicated to refining and planning the specifics of their research uh, projects, culminating in a proposal 
to the program office that will lay out the specific resources needed to execute the project. So um, the project will run for two years, um, after which the focus will then shift towards communicating and translating the results to affect change. So um, all of that is a, a, you know, in that bucket. And so as a reminder, again, that for cohort seven, uh, this year's theme, uh, we're focusing on structural racism again. Again, as Vanya said, um, racism, we, we at IRL start from the initial foundation that racism exists and contributes to health inequities. IRL is seeking proposals that build evidence for solutions to eliminate the structures that perpetuate racial inequities in health. Uh, proposals that uh, we're looking for proposals that seek to to further um, the, the proposals that seek to further document the existence or impact of structural racism and racist policies will not be selected. We don't want just the documentation of these, uh, these policies. What we're wanting or what we're looking for is um, a focus on solutions for eliminating structural racism in healthcare and health services delivery. Next slide. Um, we are interested in uh, solutions or um, you know, projects that are generating community engaged evidence for equitable approaches for improving the well-being of Black, Brown, and Indigenous people. Um, we are interested in uh, developing out or supporting uh, projects that mitigate processes and mechanisms through which policies, practices, and programs uphold structural racism in institutional systems. So we're thinking about a range of institutional systems, thinking about access to housing, education, employment, the criminal legal system, economic systems broadly, right? So um, we are looking for projects that are providing solutions to reduce and eliminate um, uh, less explicit barriers. So thinking about uh, sis uh, systemic disenfranchisement of uh, um, black, brown and indigenous communities from political and social involvement. We're thinking about redlining and the legacy of redlining in black communities and breaking that uh, legacy. Um, we're thinking about a range of other um, uh, elements but thinking about the solutions to those key explicit, uh, less explicit barriers. So um, let's turn now, next slide, to uh, thinking about a few more details on applying to IRL. And I'll turn it over to Tobin. Thanks so much, Zinzi. Um, regarding how to apply for this funding opportunity, um, very, very specifically, each team of three individuals will submit one application. Those applications must be submitted through the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation online system, uh, myrwjf.org. And applicants uh, will be able to follow instructions and use the templates on that online uh, system for uh, submitting their application. Uh, to be very clear, the fellowship program applications are due on Wednesday, May 4th, 2022. Uh, each applicant organization must submit a complete application, including information about the organization and its selected team. That information includes a proposed research project description, which will, uh, as mentioned previously, be a, a fairly brief uh, discussion of that um, idea, uh, which will be later um, um, provided an opportunity for selected teams to develop that into a more full uh, application. But the initial uh, project description is, uh, I, I believe, about two, two to three pages. Uh, there's uh, a, a place on the application to describe team collaborations uh, existing, uh, prior existing, and also uh, planned uh, collaboration efforts. Um, there's an there's a opportunity to describe individual leadership and research influence and aspirations for each um, team member, and uh, the biographical sketches for each of the team members. We will be selecting uh, up to 15 teams into the cohort seven. Uh, um, of the IRL program. Um, with the help of uh, the IRL research team, teams will spend that first four to five months, uh, uh, four to six months actually of their fellowship 
uh, refining uh, and expanding their research proposal. Um, you'll have an opportunity for review uh, and also a mentorship. Uh, and then uh, that, uh, that um, application will ultimately be uh, you know, approved for, by the National Program Center. And the research funds, which have been mentioned previously, the one-time $125,000 uh, award, uh, those will be released upon approval of that uh, refined research proposal. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this slide shows a screenshot of the applica uh, application homepage in the RWJF online system, uh, again at myrwjf.org. You will need to register your team in the online system and complete several questions. Um, you will also uh, be able to download, complete, and submit the application templates for the various components of this uh, solicitation, which I just described. Each team of three people will submit just one application. One person should initiate the application and then invite the other two team members to contribute to the same proposal by clicking on the blue invite button that is located midway down the left-hand side of the screen. It's highlighted here in this slide by the blue arrow. And we encourage all three team members to log on as soon as possible so everyone is aware of the application requirements. This year we have uh, highlighted uh, or um, have the, the community uh, applicant, uh, the community team member listed first. Uh, and we encourage, um, encourage the community uh, organization to, um, to log in, uh, but any of the three team members can, uh, can initiate that process. And I uh, just want to highlight uh, as well on the next slide, uh, the timeline for this uh, call for proposals. So as uh, you all know, uh, March 2nd, the call for applications opened. Uh, today, March 17th, is our webinar for pr uh, prospective applicants to learn more. May 1st, or sorry, May 4th, uh, as I mentioned previously, the applications are due. Uh, we have several steps that follow that, um, that uh, applications do in the period from May to June of this year. Those applications will be reviewed. Um, we will be having uh, four um, expert reviewers, uh, including uh, content reviewers on structural racism, uh, as well as uh, you know, alumni and program um, leaders that are reviewing those applications. Um, at that point, um, we will select uh, up to 30 teams who will be uh, invited to participate in an interview process through Zoom. Those will happen in July of 2022. In late August, our finalists will be identified and, um, and the selection process, which uh, Vanya previously described is going through our National Advisory Committee and ultimately invitations will come from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And the official start date of this uh, cohort seven of the IRL program is November 1st, 2022. Uh, and then our first in-person convening uh, is planned for May of 2023 in Washington, DC. And I'll turn it over to, um, to Vanya for uh, addressing a few other questions. So we're gonna move into the phase of um, this uh, webinar where we answer questions. Um, as you, I want to publicly thank the IRL team. Uh, um, uh, there've been a lot of questions already asked and the answers that you're getting is, are, are from our team here at the National Program Center. Um, we are asking you to use the Q&A feature, which um, a lot of people have already started doing. Um, we're sort sorting through right now some of the questions. Um, your name and institution will not be identified if we read your question, we'll just read the question so for those that have more specific details in the question, um, we might not say it out loud, but there are some themes that we've noticed around questions and having ran this program. If your question doesn't get answered during this webinar and you still have detailed questions, please do not hesitate to email us 
at the research leaders at umn.edu um, email address. So let's start with some, what we know, next slide please, are some really general questions that we often get asked when it comes to applying for the Robert Wood Johnson Interdisciplinary Research Fellows Program. And the first one is, what are the expectations of the community partner? We get asked this a lot. Um, what we want to remind everyone who's applying for this program is that it's a shared leadership program. We want fully collaborative participation alongside the research partners. The community partners, they are to lead um, as part of the IRL team. Learning and leadership development activities, as well as an active leader in the project is the expectation of the community partner. Lead community engagement efforts, including um, how the research is being conceptualized and disseminated. We want you to commit to the three-year program and draw on this experience to act to be change leaders in the field. So we, we want to make sure that you're a full participant alongside your research partners. I'm going to let Tobin answer the next ask and answer the next question. Tobin, how about you join me? Thanks. So we do get this question a lot as well, uh, which is if I'm a PhD student or completing a postdoc, Am I eligible to apply as either the research partner or the community partner? And in brief, the answer is no, you are not eligible. Um, again, we're looking for experienced, um, uh, um, both researchers and community partners. Uh, and uh, in, in the case of the researcher uh, or someone who is a, a PhD student or postdoc, um, we're explicitly saying, no, you are not eligible to apply. All right, next question. What is the definition for a mid-career researcher? We get this all the time. Um, I'm gonna start by answering this question by saying we're looking for applicants who are not just starting out or in trainee programs or late in their career where they're looking at retirement within the next five years. So what does that mean? That means there's a wide range of people who fit this definition of mid-career. So while we don't have a set definition for mid-career, generally speaking, um, researchers who are about five years out from their PhD or other terminal degree, um, we've gotten asked a few questions about types of degrees. PhD is one terminal degree. There are others that are eligible for IRL or have extensive research or evaluation experience and are not within 10 years of retirement. So mid-career, you're not in training and you're not about to retire is the short answer of what is a mid-career researcher. This is also true. We've had this in the chat already today. Does this definition um, apply to the community partner? Yes, same definition, mid-career, you are asked about it. We wanna make sure you too are not within a training program and you're not about to retire. So we're looking for people who are in this mid-career space. We want people who are skilled and experienced in doing the research and the work in their career and aren't at the end. Researchers and community leaders who are interested in, apply, in applying are invited to make their case for their mid-career status in their application material. So if you could tell us why you're mid-career, um, that actually helps out in, the, in thinking about how you're eligible as mid-career. So let's talk about some other questions. We do have a little bit of time um, and some of the questions in the chat that have been brought up are specifically around funding and how this funding mechanism works. One of the pieces of funding that was brought up was the $15,000 that goes to the community partner. So we do have $15,000 annually that is provided directly to the community partner and their organization in order to offset the costs of participating in the Robert Wood Johnson Interdisciplinary Research Fellows Program. That money is not a part of your research dollars. That money is not a part of your fellowship dollars. That money is to acknowledge that the work that the community partner is doing in order to engage the community in a way that's meaningful for research looks different than a researcher and may require some additional supports. There's a small grant mechanism that we ask you to apply for to get those funds, but it's an unrestricted fund that you tell us how your community partner and organization needs those funds. Next question that I'm going to have Tobin answer is um, around the research dollars. Can you talk a little bit about the detail in the application for the research dollars to be allocated? Yeah, so uh, first of all, we recognize that $125,000 over the course of essentially two years uh, in the program 
uh, to you know carry out a research project is uh, a, a fairly modest amount of money uh, in terms of um, you know how how researchers often think of of research dollars. Um, so we want you to be very clear about. Um, what's feasible within um, within that budget and also within the time limit. And we spend a lot of time talking about that and, and um, you know, working with you as uh, you know as as a research team. The um, the the project budget uh, really is something that um, you, you will develop and uh, identify um, what the what the resources, how the resources need to be allocated. And we've had a wide range of different, uh, allocations of the budget, um, and um, we we have pretty broad latitude and flexibility in um, you know how that money is spent. Uh, they do need to go to legitimate um, project related experiences, um, but we definitely encourage uh, investment, uh, particularly in communities, for uh, those um, project dollars. Uh, and, and, and allocating that budget. So some of the things that can be done is um, we, we, we strongly uh, recommend and encourage um, you know, payment um, and compensation for the time that community partners uh, and, um, and you know, people from the community that you're uh, getting information from, um, pay them for their time and that can come directly out of that, um, that research budget. Um, but we, again, we'll work, we'll work with teams, um, selected teams uh, over the course of developing their, um, developing their proposals with the budget as well. And, um, and there is flexibility even after those, um, even after those budgets are submitted. Um, and we've had to be very flexible with those um, throughout COVID. So we have a, a fair amount of experience doing that. So the next question we're going to answer, which we've gotten asked a lot, um, in part because we've had we've been around now for um, six years, given this is our seventh um, call for applications, is if I have applied before and my previous application was unsuccessfully funded, can I apply again? And the answer is a resounding yes. I will say we have put together some resources on our, our application, our, our page, um, irlleaders.org, um, that address this exact issue because we want to make sure that if you're reapplying, you're reapplying with uh, addressing some of some of the challenges that may have posed in your original application. It might be your application was really stellar and you were among stellar other applicants, which is likely, um, and we have to select a cohort composition. Um, so some of the answers to give to the question of can you apply and what are some things you can consider? Look at your application. Um, see if there are things that you can make changes that fit the theme uh, much more aligned with the call that we've put out this time. If there are some things that you might need to change, consider changing them. Also look at the composition of your team. You may wanna consider changing different researchers or community partners. Consider changes that you may wanna make if you reapply. The idea here is that we would love you to, have, to consider IRL as, an, as a program to enroll in or apply to, and we wanna make sure you're as successful as possible. So please consider reapplying and you are eligible. We're looking forward to having your application. The next question that we'll answer publicly and, and live is the question about training and being um, in a, a PhD program if you're not the researcher. So it was very clear the training of the researcher. We're actually asking all of our applicants in a team to not be a, 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 in a training program. So if you're the community partner and you are in a PhD program, the reason that we, have, we deem that that is not probably an eligible place. Now, again, you're willing to apply and make the case, um, but as of right now, our stance is that's not eligible, in part because what does that mean for the training that you're receiving in IRL and the differential in mid-career? So in some ways, if you're a current trainee and you can't describe how that program fits into your mid-career status, this is where that gray space is, it may be that you don't look like a mid-career person given your you're currently in your training. I'm not saying don't apply if you're in your training, but I am saying that very early on, you need to decide if you can make the argument that you're a mid-career person in the space that you're going to occupy for your IRL application. 
And you have to bear with us. We're reading questions as we're trying to answer them at the same time. Tobin, can you answer the question around how, what does shared leadership look like in an application for Robert Wood Johnson Interdisciplinary Research Fellows Program? Yeah, shared leadership is a critically important value for um, the IRL program. And um, what that looks like in practice ranges pretty widely, but um, it really is found uh, foundational on um, you know, respect and reciprocity among the three um, among the three team members. Um, we we run into some challenges um, if um, you know, folks are sort of uh, taking the lead uh, on on certain things. We want to ensure that um, everyone on the team is is signing off on decisions. Uh, and most specifically uh, around the research and around um, how the money uh, for the research project is being spent. Um, so we want agreement uh, and, and a unified team um, in, in the decision-making process. In the application, um, we need you to take very seriously the processes that your team will put in place to ensure that those decisions are uh, are um, made um, together uh, and and um, you know represent uh, the 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 full full um, support and participation of all three team members. Uh, again, there is no there is no principal investigator uh, on on the IRL teams, uh, and um, you know we we uh, want to reinforce that value. Uh, within within the IRL program, um, we will also provide supports uh, for um, fellows who are selected into the program um, to um, you know um, pursue these these processes um, as we go through the program, and, and it's a it's a key part of. Um, what what we're trying to do within the curriculum of IRL as well. Um, so we we provide supports for that shared decision making all the way through uh, the program. Thank you so much um, for joining me and, and answering, asking and answering questions based on what we have been asked. We're gonna go ahead and move on and Tobin, can you um, highlight our, our partnership here at how we do this in IRL? Yeah, um, so, you know, partnership, shared decision-making is, a, is a, a critical part of IRL, as I just mentioned, and um, we have some really important partners um, within the IRL National Program Center. Uh, I'm at the University of Minnesota, uh, where I'm on the faculty, uh, and this is the National Leadership Center for the program. Um, we also have an incredibly strong uh, partnership uh, first with Johns Hopkins uh, Bloomberg School of Public Health, where Dr. Jones is on the faculty, uh, and, and um, we are able to, uh, to uh, partner with other uh, folks who are at Johns Hopkins, as that's a critically important partnership for us, as well as Academy Health, um, which is uh, the premier health policy organization in the U.S., uh, and so we've created this team of partners because we recognize that we need to rely on thought leaders, both uh, in and outside of academia, to help design and implement a vision for a truly innovative program that can catalyze new ways of doing research and uh, new ways of transforming that research into action, which are the sort of the, the founding values of the IRL program. Um, we also are very pleased to have a, a growing number of alumni who will understand the, the, the values of IRL and um, be able to help um, you know, new program fellows uh, along the way. So we're very, very excited about um, what, we've, what we've helped to build here and also um, looking forward to bringing on a new cohort uh, in, in, our, uh, in this next year. Thanks very much for, um, for joining us today. And again, please do um, contact us with additional questions. Again, that is um, that email address is researchleaders at umn.edu. And that is our next slide. Um, that is our 
presentation today. Um, please check out our frequently asked question page, page if you have additional questions. Email us and um, look for any emails from us if you've registered for this webinar. Thank you very much. Um, and we look forward to seeing your application. Have a great day.